Well, Answers in Genesis is an apologetics organization. The word apologetics comes from the Greek word apologia, which in 1 Peter 3.15 is translated answer. Always be prepared to give an answer, to give an apologetic, a logical reason defense of the faith. We equip people with answers to defend the Christian faith against the attacks of our day. And one of the sad things that I see is that most Christians today can't defend the Christian faith against the attacks of our day. Most Christians don't know how to answer skeptical questions. And I'm going to show you why that's important to be able to do so today. 2007, we opened the Creation Museum. It's in the northern Kentucky area, just in greater Cincinnati area, actually. Uh, we're within a one-day drive of two-thirds of the population. How many of you may have been to the Creation Museum? Hmm. Okay, how many of you have been to Disneyland or Universal Studios? Okay, I see a problem here, all right? Uh, the Creation Museum is every bit as good as Disneyland or Universal Studios in regard to the quality of the exhibits and what we do. It's an incredible place. Uh, and you can spend two days there, because most people do. Uh, but the difference between us and Disneyland Universal Studios is we tell the truth. And we preach the gospel. Uh, so it's a lot of difference. But we have animatronic dinosaurs, animatronic people. We have live animal displays, uh, planetarium, take him into outer space, and uh, really all from a biblical perspective, a special effects theater, and also life-size exhibits where we walk you through the Bible. That's what it is. It's a whole walk through the Bible. It makes the Bible come real, answering the skeptical questions of this age. Uh, we even have animatronic Methuselah that will give you a great message. We walk into a section of Noah's Ark as well, and you can even... Uh, touch a screen and ask Noah questions and he'll answer you. Uh, we have a Dragon Legends exhibit and all sorts of other exhibits. A world-class insectorium, world-class collection of insects that are displayed like I've never seen displayed in any other facility. And an animatronic Dr. Arthur Pod, the very latest in animatronics, as he teaches lessons to you. We just opened a $1.5 million allosaur exhibit. We were given uh, one of the best Allosaurus skull, uh, fossils ever found, and it is, one, it is the best Allosaurus fossil skull ever found. And so we just opened that, and the atheists are really upset that we've got that uh, incredible fossil. We have lots of other fossils on displays there too. And then we have the beautiful gardens, and in case, because I know we're in Southern California, so uh, that green stuff is grass and trees, <laughs> and the stuff in the middle there, that's water. Now, that's another example of water right there. It actually is liquid and it flows. And uh, We also have a petting zoo with also unique uh, hybrid animals and the biggest and best zip line course in the Midwest, 23 zip lines, uh, 12 sky bridges, two super zip lines, a whole challenge course, biblical uh, echo tour signs, and it brings a lot of non-Christians in as well as others. It's an incredible family facility. So you're all coming now, right? Uh, we're going to come out to the Creation Museum. Um, and if you, come, if you come next year, in the first six months of next year, we're actually, our next project, uh, which is 40 minutes away from the Creation Museum, we have 800 acres actually on one of the busiest interstates in America, Interstate 75, and we're building a life-size Noah's Ark out of wood with a whole walk-through series of exhibits. And the wood actually goes up next year between January and July, and we have 100 uh, Amish people who are doing that. Uh, putting the wood up because they built the biggest timber frame building in America and this is going to be now the biggest timber frame building in America. So all the infrastructure gets done for the rest of this year. But if you come to the Creation Museum, you'll be able to go down and actually see the ark under construction. It'll be once in a lifetime opportunity. I mean, how many other times in history could you ever see Noah building the ark? Uh, so this is your opportunity. And then you're going to come back in 2016 when it's open. And then you just have to come back every year after that. Uh, okay, so... It's actually what, what we do at the Creation Museum, and this is what I want to talk to you about today, which is very important. We actually walk people through the Bible. Why do we do this? Why even build a Creation Museum? Why a ministry of answers in Genesis? Well, we walk people through what we call the seven seas of history. This is really an outline of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Creation, creation in six days, the creation of Adam and Eve, the kinds of animals and plants, corruption, the entrance of sin and death, catastrophe, the flood of Noah's day, uh, uh, confusion, the Tower of Babel. If you stop right there, you realize what the Bible is revealing to us, what God is revealing to us is the history in anthropology, the history in biology, the history in geology, the history in astronomy to help us understand this whole universe, who we are, where we came from, what it's all about, why things are the way they are today, and then presents the gospel based on that history. 
But we live in an age called a scientific age. We have people today telling us, oh, science has shown you can't trust this history here. This history is not true. Even many Christians say you can believe in evolution millions of years. It uh, doesn't matter. Who cares about Genesis as long as you trust in Jesus? But do you realize something? The message of Jesus, the message of the cross, the message of the gospel depends on that history being true. I mean, if we're not descendants of one man, if there wasn't a literal Adam and Eve, tell me where you came from. If Adam didn't sin, then what is sin? then why are we sinners? Where do we get that from? What does it mean that Jesus is the last Adam? If death wasn't the penalty for sin, why does uh, Adam get the blame for that in the New Testament? By one man, sin in the world, and death by sin. You see, that history there is very, very important. And the devil knows that. The devil knows if you can get generations to doubt that history, they won't believe the rest of the Bible. And of course, if that history is not true, then marriage can be anything you want to make it to mean, which would suit many people in today's world as you know, including the President of the United States. You know, 1 Peter 3.15 says, always be ready to give answers. And what I want to show you is, we, we can talk for hours. In fact, next week we're going to talk for hours, all of our speakers, and giving all sorts of answers to equip you to defend your faith. But I just wanted to give you just a little summary of these. Every topic I cover here, we could spend hours on. I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes on each, just to give you sort of an inkling of the way we can use science to defend the Christian faith, to confirm the Bible's history. You know, if you start through those seven C's, the first C was creation. Creation. Is there any evidence that God created? Actually, I want to show you evidence from biochemistry. When you look at DNA, DNA is that molecule of heredity that makes up our genes, make up our chromosomes. You know, the two scientists who discovered DNA back in 1953 were atheists. You know what they said? We've shown that there's no God because life is just built on the molecules, just chemistry. That's all it is. Well, just chemistry. Actually, we've now found out DNA is not just chemistry. You know what DNA is? It's like books of information. All the instructions that build you or build an elephant or build a, a, a dog or a cat or whatever, incredible amount of information. You know how much information is in the DNA of all the different living things in, in this world? Zillions of bits of information, incredible amount of information. Oh, by the way, all that information that's in those books, like DNA, uh, it has to be read by a language. Oh, you know what? DNA actually has the information to make the language that reads the DNA that makes the language that reads the DNA. <laughs> if, you don't, if it's not all there, it's not going to work. And here's the interesting thing. Scientists now have been able to show some things very clearly. Dr. Werner Gitt is an information scientist from Germany. Here's what he found. There is no natural law through which matter can give rise to information. You're going to believe in evolution? You believe matter somehow gave rise to information for life? Wait a minute. We've never seen matter produce one bit of information, let alone the zillions of bits of information that we have out there. Not only that, he found as an information scientist, code systems, a language, always comes from an intelligence. You can't get a language system just from matter by itself. An intelligence is responsible. You know what DNA really cries out? In the beginning, God created. <laughs> That's why the Bible says, if you don't believe in God, you're without excuse. Isn't it exciting to be a Christian? Wow, three people. Three people were excited that time. That's great. <laughs> you're all going to sleep. You're ready for your afternoon nap. Okay, let me give you another example. Let's see if we can excite you more. Hey, in Genesis 1, the Bible says that God made kinds of animals and plants after their kind. You know, the secularists attack the Bible and they say, see, the Bible's wrong. You know, you can't trust the Bible as a science book because, look, it got, it got biology wrong here. It says animals can't change. And we see animals change. We see different species of fish. We see different species of dogs. Wait a minute. The Bible doesn't say animals can't change. You know what the Bible says? God made kinds after their kind. And if you think about it very carefully, as our scientists have done, you know, in the classification system, kingdom, farm, class, order, family, genus, species, do you realize something? The word kind, in most instances, we believe, is at the family level of classification, not species, not genus, which, which is important to understand because the secularists mock those of us who believe in Noah's Ark, saying he couldn't fit all the species of animals on board. The Bible doesn't say that Noah took all the species of animals on board. It says he took two of each kind of land animal. Kind of land animal. Now, we would say that there's only one kind of dog, and it's called dog, by the way. Uh, they have different species of dogs, but there's only one family of dogs. There's only one family of cats, but you have different species of cats. You see, what we see out in the world there, based on the Bible, here's what we would say. 
there's a creation orchard. There's all these trees, a tree that represents a dog kind, a tree that represents the finch kind or the elephant kind. And because of all the genetic information God put in there, you can have different species of dogs, but dogs remain dogs. You can have different species of finches, but finches remain finches. That's exactly what you see, that God created all the information to start with for each of these kinds. Now, of course, if you believe in evolution, somehow matter produced information, which we've never seen it happen. Matter produced a language system, which is, is impossible and somehow over millions of years matter produced all this new information to, to produce all these different kinds that's not what you see in fact when you look at this this is a religion this is a belief to explain life without God and here's how the evolutionists con you all they say oh look you can see different changes in, in finches and you can see changes in dogs given enough time all those changes add up to one kind changing into another no those changes are only within boundaries and in fact, I can show you how, how this happens. Now, you can go to a lot more detail. This is just a big picture perspective. We have all these different species of dogs, okay? But they all belong to the one dog family. Now, we don't know how many dogs God made originally. Let's say he made two dogs, and they got married and had kids, and they got married and had kids, and they got married and had kids. And then we end up with lots of dogs. Okay, so here we are with lots of dogs. Now, how do you get dingoes and wolves and coyotes? Well, if you understand, there's an incredible amount of genetic variability in the dog kind or in the cat kind or in the elephant kind incredible amount now the bible says two of each kind went on noah's ark not two of each species two of each kind which means in most instances two of each family well, you know, our scientists have been researching how many kinds are there. And the way they do this, for instance, and we've got papers on our website where they're doing this for our ARC project. They'll look at a particular kind like dogs and they'll be able to document this dog bred with this one and this one with this one and this one with this one and somewhere in the world this one bred with this one and this one with this one. This one doesn't breed with this one, but you can still connect them all the way back. So they would say they're all the one kind. You get the idea? And so they've actually uh, projected right now, it looks like there's going to be less than 1,000 actual animal kinds. Most animals aren't that big. Just over 2,000 animals on Noah's Ark. There was tons of room on that ark. When anyone mocks at you and says, Noah couldn't fit all the animal on the ark, you just need to say, wait a minute. Let's look at this carefully. And you can show them that's to, you know, that accusation is not true. Two dogs come off the ark and they start to increase in numbers again. But you know what's going to happen? They're not going to stay together. Eventually they split up, go to different places, and you end up with different combinations of genes. Just like each of you is a different combination to your parents, but all the information came from your parents. Because there's incredible genetic variability in the human kind, as there is in the dog kind, the cat kind, the elephant kind. And over time, as they get isolated from each other, some survive better than others. That's called natural selection or adaptation, which has nothing to do with evolution. You'll end up with different species of dogs. And you know what the evolutionists say? Oh, when you see speciation, that's all a part of evolution. And this is evidence for evolution, which is a load of nonsense. People in the Creation Museum, we show these dog skulls. They're different species of dogs. Now, Evolutionists today wouldn't use dogs as an example of evolution because we've been able to see many of those species breed uh, in the last few hundred years. But they use this as evidence for evolution. When Darwin went to the Galapagos Island, and because it was Darwin, that's why they use these, uh, these finches that he collected had big beaks and little beaks and medium-sized beaks and different species of finches. By the way, they're still finches. And what were they? Finches. And what will they be? Finches. Is that evolution? That's finches. Uh, but because Darwin collected them, this is used as the classic example for evolution in textbooks. Just for interest, how many of you remember this from school that the Darwin's finches were used? Yeah, but people, do you realize something? There's actually more, there's actually more, um, where did I go? The wrong way that time. There's more variability in those dog skulls than there are in those beaks of finches. And yet they wouldn't use the dog skulls because we've done so much work on dogs and we know how many of them came about in the last couple of hundred years. Because we didn't see this finch species form, ah, this is evolution. And given enough time, said Darwin, when you look at these beaks, eventually this is evidence of this tree. But it's not. It's only evidence of variation within the finch kind, if you get the idea. And you see, that has nothing to do with evolution. Actually, what's called natural selection and adaptation, when you understand it, is the opposite of evolution. I can't believe it's taught as evidence for evolution in the textbooks, but it is. Our students are being brainwashed into believing something that's not true. Now we go on to the second C, corruption. The Bible reveals that to us that the world is a fallen world that we live in. And in fact, sin and death entered the world that was once perfect. 
And you know, this is an important topic to answer too, death, for a number of reasons. First of all, everyone in this room, unless the Lord comes back first, is going to face death because we're humans, because we're descendants of Adam and Eve, that's why. Richard Dawkins, that famous atheist, is going to face death. Everyone will because we're humans. You know one of the questions in today's world? You'll hear it all the time. Whenever there's a tragedy in particular, like a 9-11 or a tsunami hits Indonesia or whatever, how can you believe in a loving God with all the death and suffering in the world? Where's your loving God? God must be unjust. Look at all the people suffering today. Look at those children dying over there in Africa. God must be unjust. By the way, whenever a non-Christian says God's unjust, ask them how they determine what's just and what's unjust. Because how can a Christian do that? I had an atheist once say to me, your God must be unjust. I said, you're an atheist. You can't accuse anybody of being unjust. <laughs> Because you can't. You think about it. Because uh, they don't have an absolute basis for their standards, just their opinion. You've got to point out the inconsistency, by the way, in their logic. But you see, the issue of death is an important one too because there are billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. Did you know that most of the fossil record, some of those layers of the Grand Canyon actually exist across the continental US and in other continents around the world? you realize how massive they are? Do you realize how far they extend? Incredible. Most people don't know that. But you know, they're full of dead things. Wait a minute. We're told that these layers were laid down millions of years before man. There are many Christians that believe the fossil layers were laid down millions of years before man. But if, if the fossil layers were laid down millions of years before man, then Christians have a major problem. In fact, it undermines the gospel, undermines the word of God. Let me show you why. Adam, you can eat of all the trees. There's one tree you're not to eat of, because if you do, you'll surely die. It was a test of obedience. God didn't make Adam to be a puppet to force him to love him. He wanted him to love him, because he chose to. So he gave him a choice. And Adam rebelled against God. Adam disobeyed God. That's called sin. That's where sin came from. That's the origin of sin. And death is a consequence. In fact, the first death, I believe, was in the garden when God killed animals and made clothes for Adam and Eve out of animal skins. Now, why did God do that? Well, actually, at the Creation Museum, one of my favorite exhibits is because it points to Jesus, is this one. We call it the sacrifice scene. The first blood sacrifice is a covering for their sin, a picture of what was to come in Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You see... When God killed animals and clothed Adam and Eve, it was setting up the sacrificial system that, you know, the Israelites sacrificed animals over and over and over again, but recognizing their sin and coming before a holy God. But it was also pointing to the fact that one day the Messiah would come. In fact, you know the first time the gospel is preached in the Bible? Where's the first time the gospel is preached? It's Genesis 3.15. I'll put enmity between you and the woman, your seed, her seed. He shall bruise your head, you shall bruise his heel. That's the message of Jesus. We understand that now. The message of Jesus preached right there in Genesis. By the way, if Genesis is not true, if it's just mythology, if it's just a story that's not really true, it's not history, as many even Christian leaders will tell you, then so is the gospel not true. Because the gospel is preached right there in Genesis. In fact, when God killed animals and clothed Adam and Eve, it's the origin of clothing. I notice you are all wearing clothes, which is good, by the way. Because uh, we live in a fallen world. Animals don't wear clothes. Why do we wear clothes? Because we're not animals. We're made in the image of God. And we have a conscience. And sin distorts nakedness. And, and God knows that sin has caused a problem. And so he made clothes for Adam and Eve. But at the same time, it was a reminder that God was going to provide a way to take away their sin. You see, Hebrews 9 tells us without the shedding of blood, there's no remission, no forgiveness of sin. Why the shedding of blood? Because the life of the flesh is in the blood, we're told. Blood represents life. You see, Adam rebelled against God. And because Adam, and because we're descendants of Adam, what he did, we did. He sinned, we sinned. We come from Adam. And therefore, death is a consequence. Now, his body will die. But because we're made in the image of God, we have a soul. We're different to the animals. They're not made in the image of God. Our soul is going to live forever. But we'd be separated from God forever. But God had a plan from eternity. His plan was to step into history in the person of Jesus Christ, the God-man, to become our relative, related to us, because we all go back to Adam. We're all one big family. We're all related to each other, whether you like it or not, by the way. And we all go back to Adam and Eve. He stepped into history to be Jesus Christ, the God-man, to die on a cross, be raised from the dead, offers a free gift of salvation. You see, Hebrews tells us the blood of bulls and goats can't take away our sin. We're not an animal. So an animal can't take away our sin. That was just pointing to the one who would come to take away our sin. And we don't sacrifice animals today. Why? Because the Bible says Jesus Christ died once and for all. 
He is the ultimate sacrifice. Now, I say that to you for this reason. If you believe in millions of years, as many Christians do, then the millions of years came from the belief that the fossils were laid down millions of years before man. That means there was bloodshed millions of years before man. But if without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. So if before man sinned, you had the shedding of blood, what has the shedding of blood got to do with the remission of sins? You just destroyed the whole basis of the atonement. Not only that, in the fossil record, supposedly millions of years before man, you have lots of examples of animals eating each other, bones in their stomachs. You know what the Bible says? Originally Adam and Eve ate fruit and the animals were vegetarian. Because there wasn't any death in the world. The Bible calls death an enemy. One day death will be thrown into the lake of fire. There was no death originally. We weren't even told we could eat meat until after the flood when God said, just as I gave you the plants, now I give you everything. And by the way, that's why you can eat a hot dog, because it is everything. And so the origin of a hot dog is in Genesis, just so that you know, right there. But you see, our diet changed because sin changed everything. You know what else is in the fossil record? Did you know in the fossil record, said to be millions of years before man, there's evidence of diseases like brain tumors, cancer, arthritis. See, at the end of the creation, when God made Adam, at the end of the sixth day, he said everything he made was very good. Everything was very good. If you have cancer and brain tumors before that time, then God's calling cancer very good. He's calling brain tumors very good. People, you can't have death, bloodshed, diseases before sin. Not only that, in the fossil record, there are fossil thorns said to be hundreds of millions of years old. The Bible says clearly, thorns came after the curse. The fossil record, if you take God's word as written, that fossil record could not have been laid down millions of years before sin. These two things cannot be true at the same time. Death millions of years before man, death after sin. Which means when you're looking at layers like the Grand Canyon, wait a minute, those layers with fossils had to be formed after man sinned. Is there anything in the Bible that could explain how you could get billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth? Of course. God tells us there was the catastrophe of Noah's flood when God judged uh, the world with, with uh, a flood because of the wickedness of man. By the way, if there really was a global flood, you'd expect to find billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. And what do we find? Billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. That's one of the reasons why it answers in Genesis to help people understand. For instance, when Mount St. Helens erupted on May 18, 1980, many people don't realize this, but hundreds of feet of sedimentary layers were laid down. That layer in the middle is 30 feet thick, consists of thousands of individual layers like that, and it took three hours to be formed. There were canyons carved through even hard rock by mud flows in a matter of days, months, and a few years. You know, people often say to me, but wait a minute, there's not enough water to cover the earth. How could you have a global flood? I mean, you look at the Himalayas. You, there's not enough water to cover all those. How do you know the Himalayas existed before the flood? How do you know that? See, if you level out the mountains and the ocean basins, there's enough water now to cover to a depth of two miles. There's plenty of water. How did God end the flood? Psalm 104 seems to indicate he raised up the mountains and sank the ocean basins and the water poured off into the ocean basins. By the way, the secularists believe exactly the same that mountains were raised up and ocean basins sank. It's just they make it take millions of years. We don't believe it took millions of years. We think it happened catastrophically. In fact, you know what you've got on the Himalayas? You've got marine fossils on the top of the Himalayas. How'd they get there? It makes sense. They were laid down during the flood. Then when the mountains were raised up now, that's why you have marine fossils on the top of the Himalayas. And by the way, you can actually see where uh, the, the, this raising up of mountains has occurred. For instance, give you a, uh, an example close to home. Let's go to the Grand Canyon. The Grand Canyon cuts through the Kaibab Plateau. The whole area is raised up. And when you go to the place where it was raised up, you can see where the Tapete sandstone was bent. Interestingly, evolutionists tell us that that sandstone was laid down over millions of years, and then millions of years of heat and pressure bent it upwards. But if that's so, it would be broken. But it's not broken, it was bent. It, it was bent while it was soft. Not only that, millions of years of heat and pressure would turn into metamorphic rock, and there's no evidence of that there either. Whatever happened, happened quickly when it was soft. In fact, here's what makes much more sense. That area was raised up, and when it was raised up, it formed a dam. Because today you see where there is evidence of massive lakes behind the Grand Canyon. And there were waters from the flood, rains after the flood, the sediment was still soft, the dam breaks, and the water then uh, carves out the Grand Canyon. You know when you go downstream from the Grand Canyon you find massive surge deposits. That's where the sediment was deposited. 
Most people don't know about these things. In fact, you know what happens in America? They pass legislation to protect the teaching of evolution of millions of years and to protect your children even hearing about the problems or hearing about evidences that contradict evolution of millions of years because the state is basically imposing the religion of atheism on generations of students. It was about time we woke up to that. I know there's some Christian teachers as missionaries in the public education system, but you can't deny the fact that by and large they're throwing God out, the Bible out, prayer out, creation out, and now they tell students in their textbooks you can explain the whole of life by natural processes. Do you know what that means when they say that? Do you know what explaining things by natural processes means? Do you know what naturalism is? It's atheism. Your tax dollars are being used to impose the religion of atheism on generations of kids. And people, we wonder why two-thirds of young people are leaving the church in America by the time they reach college age. Because God's word comes under attack. I had a young man just after the last service who stood there and said to me, I go to school and he said it's such an evil place and Christianity is under attack so much. And he said it's so difficult and he's just so thankful for the answers that, that we provide uh, to be able to defend the Christian faith. Let's go on and look at the next one, confusion, the Tower of Babel. Hey, you know, if the Bible's true, we're all descendants of Adam and Eve, which means there's only one biological race. Darwin was wrong when he talked about races. In fact, there are people today who still talk about races. Do you know the secular scientists know there's only one race? They do. There's only one race. There aren't any different races. In fact, when the Human Genome Project, back in the year 2000, released to the world that they had mapped the human genome across the world, and what did they say? For instance, in the New York Times, they had put together a draft of the entire sequence of the human genome and unanimously declared there is only one race, the human race. Wow, what a revelation. Who would have ever thought of that? Hey, you know what? If we had believed God's word, why wouldn't we as God's people have been out there saying that all along, saying, hey, we're all descendants of Adam and Eve. There's only one race. Why wouldn't we have been saying that? You know what? We're so intimidated by the world. We're intimidated by the evolutionists. And you see, even when I say that, there are people today who will say, well, wait a minute, how can there be only one race? I mean, you've got different colours of people. You've got white people, black people, aren't there four basic colours? No, there's only one colour. In fact, the secular world know this too. Even the National Geographic had a big article on this back in 2002, I think it was, uh, showing that everyone has the same skin colour. Do you know everyone in this room has the same skin colour? You have a pigment called melanin. It's a brown pigment. You can have a lot of it and you can have a little of it. It's not a matter of what colour you are, it's what shade you are. See, people look at me and say, well, you're a white person. I do not want to be a white person. Because let me show you, this is white. And so I don't want to look like that right now, okay? In fact, I couldn't speak to you if I was a white person. Do you realise that every one of you is the same colour? It's a pigment called melanin. Now... There's a few other pigments, but melanin is the main pigment. It's a brown pigment, so we're all brown, all right? And you need that pigment. Actually, people often say, uh, you know, you'll even hear them on the Fox News talking about, well, coloured people. Wait a minute, everyone is a coloured person. If you're not a coloured person, you've got problems, okay? I want you to understand that. Everyone is a coloured person. And by the way, this also means something else, too. When people say, what do you think about interracial marriage? There's no such thing biologically as interracial marriage because we're all one race. The interracial marriage the Bible talks against is the spiritual interracial marriage when the godly people marry ungodly people. That's the interracial marriage the Bible speaks against. And see, there are about 50 genes or more for, skin, for, for, for the amount of skin pigment you have. But let's just take these um, four genes here. Remember capital letters, meaning dominant genes, little letters, recessive genes? It makes sense that God put all the variability for genes for, for skin shade in Adam and Eve. And so Adam and Eve would have been middle brown. It makes sense. The majority of the world's population are. So those that got all big A's and big B's would have dark skin. Those little A's and little B's, light skin. That's why, and you can see in California here, uh, when you have middle brown couples, they can have children that are darker than the parents, children that are lighter than the parents. Very easy to understand. And then because of the Tower of Babel, you end up with some groups that only have all big A's and big B's, some that only have little A's and little B's. So some only produce dark skin, some only produce light skin. Very easy to understand. By the way, why is it that we have flood legends in cultures all over the world that all sound like Noah's flood? 
or sound like the record in the Bible, have the elements that are similar, because they passed it down from Noah, changed it, but the real record's in the Bible. It all attests to the truth of God's word. You see those first four C's concerning creation, corruption, catastrophe, confusion? Hey, God's revealed this to us. It makes sense of the fossils. It makes sense of the people groups around the world. It makes sense of who we are. The fact there's only, only one race it makes sense of why the evidence just cries out, in the beginning God created. And by the way, if that history is true, then the gospel that's based in that history is true but we have generations being led astray being told that history is not true and people if that history is not true then it also means that every Christian doctrine is not true for instance do you, do you realize that every single biblical doctrine of theology is based in Genesis 1 to 11 every single one you think about it why did Jesus die on a cross Genesis 1 to 11 why are we sinners Genesis 1 to 11 why do we die Genesis 1 to 11 what is marriage a man and a woman why Genesis 1 to 11 why do we wear clothes Genesis 1 to 11 why is Jesus called the last Adam Genesis 1 to 11 why do we have a seven-day week Genesis 1 to 11 why do we need a new heavens and a new earth Genesis 1 to 11 do you think Genesis 1 to 11 is important it is it's the foundational history for the whole of the rest of the Bible. By the way, if you've been influenced by the world to believe in evolution of millions of years and you've reinterpreted Genesis or told your kids it doesn't matter, you've done two things. Two things. Number one, you've undermined the history that's foundational to the gospel and all doctrines. But number two, you've undermined the authority of the word itself. See, I meet so many Christians who say, who cares about Genesis? The most important thing is to tell people that, that Jesus rose from the dead. Excuse me, where would you get the idea Jesus rose from the dead? Where would that come from? Well, the Bible. Oh, you want me to take this as written here? I see. Do you believe in the virgin birth too? Well, yeah. How do you know that? Oh, the Bible. Do you believe the Israelites crossed the Jordan River and the Red Sea as miracles? Well, yeah. Where would you get that from? Oh, the Bible. Oh, well, the Bible also says God created in six days and man made from dust, woman from his side, and death came after sin, there's a global flood. Oh, no, you can't believe that. Why not? Oh, because of what the scientists are saying in the millions of years and evolution. People, when you have said that to your children and you've let people think that, what you've said is, oh, you can believe this part of the Bible, doesn't matter about this, you can use man's ideas out here to reinterpret this, you've unlocked a door that causes them to start to doubt that you can trust any of the Bible. And it puts them on that slippery slide of unbelief. We're losing two-thirds of our young people from the church. They're walking away from the church in America. And America is heading the way of England. Two-thirds of young people say they don't believe in God in England. Church attendance in England is down from 60% to 5%. People, America's on that same path right now. 4,000 churches a year closing their doors in America. And look at the collapse of Christian morality. Hey, if you want to see the collapse of the Christian worldview, look in California. And see what's been happening here. And, and then all the emphasis on gay marriage and transgenders and, and, and bathrooms that, you know, you don't separate out from male and female anymore. You realize what's going on. Because God's word has come under credible attack. Hey, just consider the marriage for a moment. You know, when Jesus was asked about marriage, do you know what he said? I paraphrase it for you. Here's what Jesus really was saying here. What is wrong with you people? Haven't you even read and believed the book of Genesis? That's what he's really saying. You think about it. Have you not read that he made them at the beginning, male and female? Where was that? Genesis 1, verse 27. And said, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and there'll be one flesh. Where was that from? Genesis 2, 24. The account that God made Adam from dust. He looked at the animal, saw none were like him. So God put him to sleep and from his side made a woman. The whole doctrine of marriage based on the fact you're one flesh because the woman came from the man. You believe in evolution as many Christian leaders will tell you and Christian professors will tell you. You can believe in evolution. Then the woman came from an ape woman, the man from an ape man. You've just destroyed marriage. You see, marriage is to be a man and a woman. Why? Because God made a man and a woman. And you know, I know President Obama is out there pushing in a big way gay marriage across this nation. I got a message for President Obama. You are absolutely wrong. How do I know that? Because God invented marriage. You did not. And that's really the answer for him. By the way, if Genesis is not true, marriage is whatever you want to make it to be. But if Genesis is true, if the history is true, marriage is one man and one woman. Because God is the one that ordained marriage. In fact, the family is the first and most fundamental of all human institutions which God ordained in Scripture. And by the way, the whole primary uh, focus of the family, family is to produce godly offspring, Malachi 2.15, who will then produce godly offspring, who will produce godly offspring. Sadly, we've handed generations of our kids over to, to the world and said, you teach them, we'll just tell them about Jesus. 
and we wonder why we're losing them. Well, you know, as I said, not just marriage, but all of our doctrines are founded in Genesis. See, Psalm 11.3 says, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? If you take a barn that had a foundation like this one, this foundation collapsed and the barn came down. That collapsing structure to me represents the collapsing moral structure we see in our nation, in our whole Western world. Why do we see moral relativism pervading the culture? You know what the book of Judges says? When they had no king to tell them what to do, they all did what was right in their own eyes. You think that applies to America today? Yes, because what's happened? We've thrown out the king. We've thrown out the absolute authority of the word of God. And God's word has come under incredible attack. And in this day and age, that attack has been particularly focused on the first books of the Bible, the first part of the Bible, Genesis, the first chapters, I should say, of the book of Genesis. See, 2 Corinthians 11.3, God has a warning for us. God says this through Paul. I want to warn you that the devil is going to use the same method on you as he did on Eve to get you to a position of not believing the things of God. What was the method the devil used on Eve? Well, you go back and find out. Did God really say, stop right there for a moment, the first attack was on the word of God. That attack has never let up since Genesis 3. You know what uh, God is warning us? The devil is going out to attack the word of God, to get you to doubt the word of God so that that doubt will lead to unbelief. And by the way, what else did he say there in Genesis? You will become like God. You know what the battle has been ever since the beginning? A battle between God's word and man's word. See, there aren't hundreds of religions in the world. There's only two. There's only two religions, God's word, man's word. The battle has always been a battle between God's word and man's word. You know, as, as I said, look, the, dev, the devil knows. If, if he was to get out there and say to you, hey, Jesus Christ did not bodily rise from the dead, you would see it as an attack on the gospel. But when somebody says... God didn't create in six days and you can believe in evolution and, and you can believe in millions of years. People say, oh, that's not an attack on the gospel. And I say, oh, yes, it is. It's a much more powerful attack. It's a much more subtle attack because it's an attack on the word from which the gospel comes. And Satan's clever. If you just work over time, slowly, and, and, and you get generations to eventually give up the word, then you'll have, you'll have won the culture. That's exactly what's going on. And we've let it happen. People, we've basically handed generations of our kids over to the world. You teach them your views. You teach them your views of origins. That's okay. We'll just tell them about Jesus. And the undermining of the authority of the word has been happening. And now we wonder why we're losing the culture. I believe it's God's people who are at fault. I believe the church is at fault. You know what's happening in America is a reflection of the state of the church. Because by and large, most Christian leaders will not stand on God's word in Genesis. They have compromised with the pagan religion of this age, of evolution of millions of years. And we've lost generations to the world. And we wonder why we've got a problem. You see, I believe that the teaching of evolution, Big Bang, millions of years, is what I call the Genesis 3 attack of today. It permeates the world. It permeates the church. Teaching generations that, you know, the Bible can't be true. You evolved. Many Christians have said you can believe in evolution. Doesn't matter. You know, we wrote a book back in 2007 called, or 2009 actually, called Already Gone. I encourage every one of you to read that. We had America's research group go out and find these two-thirds that leave the church and ask them why. And you know what they found out? They found out they start to doubt the Bible at a young age. 40% doubting the Bible by the end of middle school. Another 45% by the end of high school. Something's causing them to doubt at a young age. What is it? The majority of kids from church homes, 90, 90 to 95%, go to public schools. And the teaching of evolution of millions of years, and particularly with pastors and Sunday school teachers and others, telling them you can believe what the world teaches, about millions of years doesn't matter was a big issue to them in regard to why they doubted the word of God and that doubt led to unbelief not only that you'll notice today many young people in our churches of the younger generation will say well why can't you have gay marriage surely if two people love each other that's okay it doesn't matter whether they're two men or two women people think about this when you have allowed generations of our kids in our churches to start outside the Bible with man's ideas of evolution of millions of years and reinterpret Genesis don't be surprised when they start outside the Bible with man's ideas of marriage and reinterpret marriage that's what's going on and we found out from this research that by and large what's happened is, you know what we tend to do in our churches and homes? We tend to teach Bible stories. Jonah and the Great Fish, Feeding of the 5,000, Paul's Missionary Journey, Jesus on the Cross, Adam and Eve. And you might say, what's wrong with that? Don't you believe those? Well, number one, 
we've got to stop using the word story today. You, you actually know why. The word story today, what does it come to mean in our modern vernacular when you hear the word story? Fairy tale, fable. And yet we say, kids, let's have a Bible story. Come to church, have a Bible story. Let's have our Bible story. People, because of the changing of the, of the meaning of the word story, we now need to talk about record of, historical account of, emphasize the Bible's a book of history because it's being attacked and, and being claimed to be just a book of mythology. Not only that, most of the kids go to public schools where, by and large, people, you can't deny it. I know there are some missionaries in the system and you need our prayers, but you can't deny it. Most kids from church homes do not survive the public education system. They don't. Most of them are walking away from the church. They're being trained in atheism. That's what it is. They're being imposed the secular religion of atheism on them, and we wonder why we're losing them. Because you think about it, what's happening in our churches and homes by and large, we're not answering the skeptical questions of the age. You know, as I travel around the world, I get asked the same questions wherever I go in this age. You believe the Bible, but science disproves the Bible. This is a scientific age. Noah couldn't get the animals on the ark. Where did Cain get his wife? Uh, what about the millions of years? Doesn't carbon-14 disprove the Bible? Dinosaurs lived millions of years ago. What you're saying about the Bible can't be true. Uh, we came from ape men. Evolution's true. How many of you have heard those questions? Yeah. You've heard those questions. You know why? Because that's the Genesis 3 attack of our day. And you know what many of us say? Well, I don't know the answers. I don't know what to do with dinosaurs. Well, it doesn't matter. Well, you can believe what you're taught at school, Johnny. That's okay. As long as you trust in Jesus. But you know what's happening underneath it all? Confidence in regard to the word of God is being eroded. That doubt. That's what's happening. You see, you know who is teaching apologetics? The public schools, the PBS channel, the learning channel. Even places like Universal Studios and, and Disney World, Disneyland. Yeah, because they teach evolution of millions of years. And you see, you know what's happening out there? Here's the evidence for millions of years. Here's the evidence you came from an ape man. Here's the evidence the Bible is not true. Here's the evidence there never was a global flood. Here's the evidence you, 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 you're just evolved by evolution. You're just an animal. Here's the evidence uh, that, that you, know, you can't trust the Bible's account in Genesis. What do we do in our homes and churches? Let's have a story. Tell them about Jesus. And we wonder why we're losing the culture. And by the way, we're losing the culture. I know, for instance, uh, you know, um, the homeschool movement has been de developed to, to, to try to overcome uh, some of this. But you know what? We're even going to lose our freedoms there, the way this culture is going. People, you have to... Uh, I'm challenging us today. I'm challenging us. Who is training your kids? Is it the world or is it us? Because parents, you're responsible. Who have we given our kids to to train? You know, we need to be teaching them how to defend their faith. We need to be teaching them answers. Yes, we teach them God's word, but we also need to get them ready for the Genesis 3 attacks of our day. You know what the Bible says? We're soldiers in a battle. And it says put on the whole armor of God. Have you put on that armor with your kids? Have you given them the sword of the Spirit, trained them how to use it, put on the helmet of salvation, the, the breastplate of righteousness, the, the, uh, the shoes shod with the, uh, the gospel of peace? Have we done that? Have we been training them and equipping them? Have we got them ready for the battle? Or do we just send them out there and let the world train them to be their soldiers? You know, as I said, there's been a battle since the beginning between... It's between two religions, two, two world views. Between God's word and man's word. And it's really between two world views. One of moral absolutes, one of moral relativism. Think about it. If God's word's true, marriage is a man and a woman. If God's word's the absolute authority, abortion is wrong. Because killing a human being in a mother's womb, that's murder. That's what it is. By the way, you know how many children have been killed in their mother's womb since Roe versus Wade in 1973? 55 million in America alone. And we look at Hitler and say, how terrible. And I mean, it was terrible what he did at the Holocaust. People, the Holocaust in America makes Hitler, what Hitler did pale in comparison. God's not going to stand by. By the way, do you know, if you read Romans 1, what's a sign that God is turning a culture over to judgment? The wrath of God. Because of a culture that rejects him as creator, as God. What's a sign that he's turning a culture over to judgment and withdrawing the restraining influence of the Holy Spirit? Homosexual behavior. Gay marriage. God is judging this nation.
And you know what? I believe he's judging the church because we're losing generations from the church. You look at the minor prophets. When people compromise God's word, I will forget your children. You're going to lose your children. You know, we see the collapse of Christian morality and increasing moral relativism because there's been a change foundationally from God's word to man's word. And let me, let me finish it up here with this. Here's the foundation of God's word, structure of Christianity, the gospel, doctrines come out of that, man's word, secular humanism, moral relativism. See, the world has been attacking God's word. The devil's been attacking God's word ever since Genesis 3. In this day and age, there's a focused attack on Genesis. And you know what? Much of the church has succumbed to it and said, we don't need Genesis. doesn't matter. We'll just keep the rest. Most of our Christian college professors compromise with evolution. And the point is, if you don't have the whole foundation, the structural collapse. And you know what we do as Christians? We look out there and we say, oh, look at the problems in the culture. Abortion, gay marriage. Don't get me wrong. We need to stand against those evils. But people, gay marriage is not the problem in this nation. Abortion is not the problem in this nation. Gay marriage and abortion are the symptoms of the problem. You see, we've spent millions of dollars trying to change the culture in regard to these issues, and it hasn't worked. You know why it hasn't worked? The Bible doesn't say go on into all the world and change the culture. It says go into all the world and preach the gospel and to make disciples. And you see, it's interesting. I had those two verses here, and I look at the back of this church, and I see go into all the world and preach the gospel. And it says you are the salt of the earth. Yes, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. What does the Bible say? You ought to be salt it says, have salt in yourselves, but if the salt's contaminated, it's good for nothing. Here's the point. We are to be out there, we're to be putting salt in our kids as uncontaminated as possible. They can't be the salt of the earth till they have salt, but we're allowing generations of them to have contaminated salt, and then they can't influence the world. Not for good. If we raise up people who are filled with salt and we go out there, then we affect the world. You've got senators and congressmen who build their thinking on God's word. That determines how they vote. You know, when you look at the fact that the, the whole legislation in regard to Hobby Lobby, that just uh, uh, in the Senate they introduced a bill to try to overrule what the Supreme Court did there, which would be overruling our religious freedom in this nation. People, you know the sad thing? That bill only lost by a few votes. And... Uh, the leader of the, the Democrats, Harry Reid, deliberately voted against it so that he can then have the ability to introduce it again later on when they hopefully, they're thinking that they can convince some of these other people to vote for it so that it will restrict religious freedom in this nation. People, it's absolutely incredible what's happening in this nation, but I still believe it's the church's fault. You see, we have handed generations of kids over to the world and said you can train them the way you want. Imagine if we were to stand on the authority of the Word of God and raise up generations, generations of kids who know what they believe, know why they believe what they do, are filled with salt that's not contaminated, can answer the skeptical questions of this age, know how to deal with the Genesis 3 attacks. You would change the world. You would change California. Well, that's the introduction. <laughs> if you... Um, And that's all that is. That is just an introduction. Uh, I encourage you to get on our website, get, get resourced. I, 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 hate, I don't like to come in and just do something like that and people say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, you only just covered a couple of things. And I, wh what do you do about dinosaurs? And I, I need more answers about this or, or about the dating methods or about carbon dating. Or, I want to be able to get these to my kids. I, I, I want to know them myself. And so what we do, we resource you. We, you can go to our website, thousands of articles. encourage you to go there. And we have a kid's website. We have a technical journal website. We also brought what I call the cream of the crop of our apologetics resources out here. We just brought, what, what, you know, I selected just a, sh a small number because I'm only here for, for the morning. And uh, this is the cream of the cream of the crop. And we give them to you at highly discounted prices, as you can see. Uh, just to help you, my book, The Lie, Evolution, really is the textbook of our ministry. What I did this morning in much more detail to really call the church to account in regard to this issue and to challenge you as Christians about taking a stand on God's word starting in Genesis and the death 
death issue and all the rest of it. Already gone, I encourage every mum and dad and teenager to read that, why we're losing kids from the church, what's happening, the influences on them. Uh, I've had many Christian leaders tell me it's revolutionised how they're actually teaching their Sunday schools and young people. The six-day issue and the age of the earth has done more to cause generations of people in our churches to compromise God's word, and the same in our Christian colleges and seminaries. So that book is very important. Those three books are like the three textbooks of our ministry. Then how do you know the Bible's true? You're going to get asked all sorts of questions. Well, who wrote the Bible? Didn't men just write it? How do you know it's true? How do you know it's the word of God? We need to know how to answer them. And these four books, we know the top 120 questions you're going to get asked about these issues because over the past 35 years, we've traveled around the world. We know what you're going to get asked. How, what about carbon dating? What about dinosaurs? What about the days of creation? How did Noah get the animals on the ark? Well, how do you, how do you explain light from the further star? How do, you, how do you deal with all these issues? We've got uh, the top 120 questions with detailed answers. I encourage everyone who can, is a good reader, certainly teenager up, even 10, 11 year old, you, you study those four books, you will have answers to, to most of the questions you're going to hear out there. And it'll really help you. In fact, I had some parents come to me at the end of the last session. I really need my, I, I really need my kids to have, have answers. And, and what's the best collection of answers? Because they don't have these answers. I don't have them. I don't know how to teach them uh, these answers. Uh, dinosaurs are used more than anything to probably convince kids um, that the Bible's not true and to convince them of millions of years in evolution. This is an incredible book on, on dinosaurs for middle school upwards, even adults. Uh, Noah's flood, very important event in history because the evidence for the flood is what's used today for millions of years. And Noah's flood uh, was also an, uh, a message of salvation. As Noah and his family went through a door to be saved, we need to go through a door. Jesus said, I am the door. Books for little kids. We're losing kids at a young age. Even little rhyme books like this. We've seen so many young kids commit their lives to the Lord. Kindergarten, preschool, grade one, two. But it teaches them the Bible's real history. I don't know how many of you saw the Bill Nye debate when I debated Bill Nye recently, uh, but um, there's four DVDs there of the whole debate. The 14 million people have now seen that uh, around the world. It's had an incredible impact, and you can get this part of our uh, YouTube's program out there. And then six of my main talks done up as 12 30-minute programs with a curriculum. It's an award-winning program. We highly discount them out in the field. But that gives you a lot more teaching. The things I covered this morning would give you a lot more of the details. There's like a whole course on that. And then a special witnessing book for you, Begin. When I was a high school teacher in Australia, people would come in and hand out the New Testament to the students. And I would always groan a little because the New Testament didn't have Genesis 1 to 11 to give the foundational history for the gospel and to counteract the wrong cosmology they were taught. So we put together this witnessing book, Genesis 1 to 11, the history that's foundational to the gospel, Exodus 20, the law, the schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, the book of John, the life of Christ, the book of Romans, the gospel in detail, last two chapters of Revelation, new heavens, new earth, summarize the Bible in the middle of all that, and then have 10 of the most asked questions today with short answers to show we can defend our faith and what does it mean to be a, a Christian, what does it mean to be saved, and we let you have that for a, a special price. And I know that, I'm not sure there's many of those left out there after the first two uh, services and let there be a lesson to you to get here earlier uh, so and then the last thing uh, the answers magazine it's a leading Christian uh, creation apologetics magazine in the world it's one of the biggest Christian magazines in America it's won many awards it's an incredible publication to help you get connected keep up to date defend your faith has a mini magazine for kids in the middle and if you subscribe you we give you a um, a th free DVD for each year subscribe. Hey, uh, I, I want to remind you, you know what we're doing? You re realize, I, I, I love the chronological approach to Bible teaching, by the way. You know what I say to people? I like to present the gospel the way God does it in the Bible by starting at the beginning. You know one of the problems? In many ways, we've lost our beginning. And we, we go out there preaching the message of the cross, but to a culture that no longer understands the beginning or even believes the book from which it comes. What a difference it makes when you get out there and start witnessing for the Lord Jesus Christ, showing people you've got answers. You can defend your faith, pointing them to the fact the history in the Bible is true, understanding faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word, and pointing them to the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, that comes from that history. Wow, what a difference you can make. I urge you to go out there and do that.